Today's lesson is CSA chemistry, specifically we continue with the mole. All right, so we started the mole last week and so we're gonna continue with that. All right, so you know, a little humor, what you get in the course, an avocado, an av avocado into six times 10 to 20 pieces, you get guacamole, all right? So, you know, just find a good humor in chemistry. Now, just a recap. Here are the five formulas that we looked at last week. Number of moles is equal to mass over molar mass. The number of particles is equal to the number of moles times Avogadro's constant. I remember Avogadro's constant is 6.02 times 10 to the 23. Our third formula is volume occupied. Now remember, anytime we see volume occupied, that refers to gas volumes, all right? So I don't want to say nobody using this formula when it comes down to liquids or solids, all right? So the third one, volume occupied, is equal to number of moles times the volume at either STP or RTP. The question will always specify which one. Number four is that the number of moles is also equal to volume times molar concentration Right, and remember, the volume must match the concentration, right? Because molar concentration is in moles per dm cube, and so the volume must also be converted to dm cube. Never you multiply cm cube with dm cube. And the last one is mass, where we have volume times the mass concentration. All right. So now we're going to move on to the mole and empirical formula, right? So we should be familiar with empirical formulas and molecular formulas, right? So empirical formula gives the simplest ratio between atoms or ions in a compound. So we'll show you an example of what we mean by that. And molecular formula shows the actual number, all right? So the empirical formula is when you simplify what is there versus the molecular where, you know, it is what is actually present in the molecule or in the compound. So here's an example. So for glucose, the molecular formula is C6H12O6. If you don't know this, you don't do science. Because even persons who don't do science know this. There's two things everybody know. The mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell and glucose is C6H12O6. All right, but that's just its molecular formula. The empirical formula now for glucose is CH2O. How did we get this? Because if you look at C6H12O6, you realize that all these subscript numbers are divisible by 6. So if you say 6 in the 6 goes one time, and so it, it cancels down to the C. If you say 12 divided by 6, you're going to get 2. So the 12 cancels down to 2. And if you say 6 again divided by 6, it will cancel down to 1. So your empirical formula is CH2O. But there are some are compounds that their molecular formula and their empirical formula is the same thing. Example here is aluminum oxide, Al2O3. Now two cannot go into three and three cannot go into two. And so this is the simplest mole ratio you will get for aluminum oxide. And so its molecular formula and its empirical formula is the same thing. All right, I hope we're all uh, keeping up with that, very simple. Now at the bottom it says to calculate the empirical formula, you must calculate the number of moles of each element and then you will divide that by the smallest mole ratio. Alright? So here's a question coming up that we can apply what we have. So here it says a sample of a solid is decomposed. Decomposed means that it's broken down. And we found to contain 6.52 grams of potassium. 4.34 grams of chromium and 5.34 grams of oxygen. What is the empirical formula of the compound? And here you see the molar mass of the three elements that are present for our question. All right. So before we move on to the next slide, let's go to the board. All right. So if we remember now, it says to calculate the empirical formula, we need the number of moles for each element. So in this, we have potassium, right? We have chromium and we have oxygen. Those are our three elements present, all right? So we need to find the number of moles for each of these three, all right? And so we were given the mass of each of them. For potassium, the mass we found was 6.52, so mass, 
6.52. For chromium, the mass was 4.34. And for oxygen, it was 5.34. All right, so these are our masses. And so we know to get the number of moles, it will be mass over molar mass. And so we're going to divide each of them by their molar mass. All right, so potassium is 39 according to the slide, right? Chromium is 52 and oxygen is 16. All right? And so the mass, molar mass, let me put that at the bottom here. So that's the molar mass. All right? And so once you get the number of moles here, number of moles here and the number of moles here, right? Then you can go on and divide by the smallest. All right? So the same thing I've done here on the slide now. So what I've done is said the number of moles of potassium, which is 6.52, divided by the 39, and you get 1.67. Then the number of moles of chromium, right, is 4.34 divided by the 52. And then for oxygen, it's 5.34 divided by the 16. So for potassium, we got 0 0.167 mole. For chromium, we got 0 0.083. And for oxygen, we got 0 0.33 mole. Let me put our next three there, because there are three decimal places. All right, so we have one, we have two, we have three. Now, the next step says to divide all of them by the smallest mole ratio. So if we look here, we look here, we look here, the smallest mole ratio that I am seeing is the 0 0.083. All right, that is our smallest one. So this will be the, the number we're using to divide this and this, all right? And so when you divide, so when you divide 0 0.167 by 0 0.083, you're gonna end up with two point something, but we'll round it down to two. Remember, whenever the number falls beneath five, you round down. If it's above five, you round up, all right? So potassium is going to be two. So K is going to be two. Chromium, since I divided by this number, chromium is going to be one. And then oxygen, you're going to say 0 0.33, so 0 0.333 divided by 0 0.083. And so oxygen is going to equal to 4.0 something. So we're rounding it down to four, all right? So, we have one, we have two, and we have three. All right? So there, we're almost finished. So we found, a, no, so remember, we found the number of moles of each. Number of moles, number of moles, number of moles. That's the first step. The second step now was to divide each of these moles by the smallest number. So out of these three, the smallest number was the 0 0.083. And that is why we divided each of them by that number. All right? So let me just put this here. And so when you divide this number by the 0 0.083, you get two. For this one is one. For this one is four. And so now our answer, the empirical formula, we have two Ks. All right, let me clear the board. All right, so for potassium, we have two, so it's K, two. For chromium, it's one, so we just write the CR. And for oxygen, it's four, so O, four. And so this is our empirical formula. All right, so we have two, we got two Ks, so it's K, two. We have one chromium, so it's CR. And we have four oxygen, so it's O4. All right? And that is how we find our empirical formula. Very simple. All right? All right. So what about molecular formula? So here are the formulas we can use to find that. So molecular formula is equal to molar mass ratio times empirical formula. Right? And what is the molar mass ratio? 
All you do is take the molar mass of the compound in the question and then you divide that by the molar mass of the empirical formula. All right? So let's move and look at what we mean by that. So here's a sample question now. On analysis, a sample of glucose was found to contain 40% carbon, 6.7% hydrogen, and 53.3% oxygen, right? Then it also gives us the molar mass of the compound, which is 180 grams per mole. So now you're being asked to find the molecular formula. All right? So the first thing you're going to do, of course, the first thing you're going to do, of course, is find the empirical formula. All right? So you said that 40% is carbon. Six point seven percent is hydrogen, right? And fifty three point three is oxygen. Now, one simple way we can convert this into grams is just to assume that the total mass of the sample is a hundred grams, right? So if we assume the total mass was 100 grams, we can say 40% of 100 would be 40 grams, right? So we have 40 grams of carbon, we will have 6.7 grams of hydrogen, and 53.3 grams of oxygen. So remember, we all we're doing is assuming it's 100 grams of the sample. That way, it's easy for us to convert the percentages into grams, all right? So of course, what you're going to do now is find the number of moles. So carbon is gonna be equal to 40 divided by 12. It's gonna be 6.7 divided by one. And this is gonna be 53.3 divided by 16, all right? So you're gonna do that and you're gonna get the number of moles, right? So we'll have 3.3 for the moles for this one. So number of moles is equal to 3.3, 6.7, and 3.3. All right, the very big comma. So that's our mole. 3.3, 6.7, 3.3. All right, so mole one, mole two, mole three. What's the next step? That's right. We must divide these three numbers by the smallest one. Now, easily we can see that the 3.3 .3 is the smallest one. All right? So this is going to be 1. 6.7 divided by 3.3 .3 is going to be 2. And this divided by 3.3 .3 is going to still be 1. So carbon is 1. Hydrogen is 2. Oxygen is 1. All right? And so, let me erase this now. Don't want a lot of space like the books that you guys have that they're writing in right now. And so, just remember that carbon is one, hydrogen is two, oxygen is one. And so the empirical formula, EF, is C, because it's one carbon, H2, because it's two hydrogen, and O, because it's one oxygen. So we just found the empirical formula. But the question is asking for the molecular formula, all right? So we need to find the molar mass ratio first. So the molar mass ratio, we're going to add up all of the elements in this and divide it by the molar mass of the compound overall. So the ratio is going to be equal to, so carbon here is what, C, so 12, plus 2, because hydrogen is 1, and there's 2 of it, plus O, which is what, 16. So we're going to have that divided by 180 from the question, all right? And so, you're gonna end up with six, all right? Your answer is gonna be six. So now we have our mole, uh, not mole, sorry, we have our um, ratio. And so now, to find the molar, or molecular formula, we're gonna say six times the empirical formula, which was CH2O. So six times the one here, so you're gonna get C6. Six times the two is 12. And six times the one 
is 6. And so this is our molecular formula. All right? C6, H12O6. All right? So first, find the empirical formula. Then you're going to add up all of the elements in the, the empirical formula and divide it by the compound's molar mass. Once you get the ratio, which is 6 for us, just multiply that by the empirical formula. And that's it. All right? All right. So now let's move on to percentage composition. So this indicates the percentage by mass of each element in the compound. So this is when you want to know how much carbon is in glucose or how much percent of um, water is attributed to oxygen, right? And here's the formula. Percentage composition is equal to the molar mass of the element that you're looking for divided by the molar mass of what? The compound, all right? And then you multiply that by 100. So here's a question. Calculate the percentage composition of hydrogen and oxygen in water, all right? So the first thing we need to find is the molar mass of the element and the molar mass of the compound. And then we're gonna multiply that by 100, all right? So, sorry. So for water, H2O, right, the, the total composition, you're gonna add the hydrogen, you're gonna add the oxygen. So since you have two hydrogens, it's gonna be two, right? And then we know that oxygen is 16, so it's two plus 16, all right? And that's equal to 18 grams per mole, all right? Now, if you look here, 18 grams per mole is just simply telling us that there's 18 grams in a mole. Simple, right? So 18 grams per mole is just saying 18 grams of water is in one mole. But if we look here, we see that out of the 18, hydrogen contributed how much grams? Two. See it here? Oxygen contributed 16 and hydrogen contributed two. And so, For our percentage composition, we're just going to plug that now into our formula, all right? So remember, moments ago, we just said that the molar mass of water, right, will be 18. And that means I have 18 grams in the one mole. Now, how much of that 18 did hydrogen contribute to it? Two. Very good. So you're going to have two over 18, then you simply multiply it by a hundred right and so when you do that you're gonna get eleven point one one percent all right so for water hydrogen is contributing to eleven point one one percent of its total mass all right and same thing now for oxygen so oxygen is equal to 16 because remember it must add up back to 18 so if hydrogen gave two oxygen is given 16 so 16 over 18 times 100, right? And you're going to end up with 88.89%. All right? So here are our two answers for hydrogen and for oxygen. Are you finished? Answer the question. Full marks, right? Nothing hard, nothing difficult. So all they do, take the total of the compound and then over it, you're going to put the element that you're looking for. All right, let's try Let's see if we we'll have a next one we can try. So it says to calculate the percentage of carbon in aluminum carbonate. And as usual, you're given the REMs. All right, so this time it specifically just wants carbon. All right. So our compound is aluminum carbonate. So Al2 bracket CO3 bracket three all right so how much carbon is here right it's three remember anytime you see a bracket in your um your formula it means that everything in, in the bracket is being affected by the number outside so you have three carbons you're going to have nine oxygen but the question only wants carbon so there's three carbon in it all right so carbon is going to be three so it's going to be 12 times three which is 36 all right 
Now we need to look at the total number now. So we have our top number here. We don't have the bottom number and we're gonna multiply it by 100. To get the bottom number, remember all you're going to do is add everything inside of your formula. So aluminum is 27, right? But there's two of it. So 27 times two plus, how much carbon is there? Three, we already worked out that to be 36. And then how much oxygen is there? Three times three, nine. So there's nine oxygen, so it's 16 times nine. All right? So you're gonna say 27 times two plus 36 plus 16 times the nine, and then you're gonna divide the 36 by that number that you will get, all right? And so the number you'll get down here is 234. So 36 divided by 234 times 100, all right? And you want to do that, you're gonna end up with 15.38%, all right? So this is your answer. All right, and see we're finished. You're not as long as the other ones. So all you do again, find the one you want and divide it by the total. Then multiply that by 100. And then that is it. All right, it's as simple as that. All right, so now let's look at the mole and chemical reactions. All right, now we all know about a few laws of conservation. But in chemistry, what it is saying is that Matter can neither be created nor destroyed during a chemical reaction, right? They are only rearranged. So when you combine hydrogen and oxygen and you get water, which is H2O, the same amount of hydrogen you start off with, the same amount of hydrogen that must be in your end product. And that is why we balance our equation because elements or atoms don't just disappear when they react or appear out of nowhere. Right, all you're doing is rearranging them. You're breaking bonds, you're putting this over here, that over there. But the same amount you start with is the same amount you must end with. All right, so it's an important law, they are only rearranged. Now, we can use this law to look at mole and chemical reactions. So, using this law, we can, we can answer any question now with moles by following four simple steps. So, the first step is calculate the number of moles of the known reactant or the known product, all right? So for something, for one of the, the products or the reactants, you'll be given the mass, all right? And then once you get that, you will use a balance equation to determine the mole ratio between the known and the unknown. So the known is what you're given in the question. The unknown is what the question wants from you. Please remember that. The known is what is given to you in the question, and the unknown is what you want, all right? So once you find the mole ratio now, you will then determine the number of moles of the unknown, all right? That's that part is fairly simple. You will determine the number of moles of the unknown, and then finally, you will use the number of moles you found and the molar mass to determine the mass of the unknown, all right? So we're gonna look at that question because I know sometimes when we get rules, it cannot go over our heads. But when we see how we can apply it, then it will come easy. So here it says to calculate the mass of magnesium oxide formed by burning 12 grams of magnesium in excess oxygen. So the first thing I always recommend you to do, write your balanced equation, all right? So here is our balanced equation. 2 magnesium in the solid state, right, don't leave off your state symbols, plus oxygen in the gaseous state will give us 2 magnesium oxide, and those are in the solid state, all right? So it's balanced because there's 2 magnesium on one side and 2 magnesium on the other side, and O2, so there's 2 oxygen on one side, and there's 2 oxygen on the other side. So this looks to me very balanced. All right, so step one says what? we must find the number of moles of the known. Now, let me go back to the question. Here in the question, what is given to us? 12 grams of magnesium. So magnesium is unknown. Pay attention, whatever you're given in the question, that is your known. So magnesium is what you have. So we're going to find the number of moles of magnesium. How do we do that? 
you're going to say mass divided by molar mass. That's, our, that's the first formula we got for moles. So you're going to say 12 divided by 24, and you're going to get 0.5 mole of magnesium. So now you, you have finished step one. You have found the number of moles of magnesium. That's step one. Step two now. You are to find the mole ratio between what you have and what you don't have or what you want from the question. So we just found the number of moles of magnesium. But what does the question want? Let's go back. The question says calculate the mass of magnesium oxide. That is what we want. That is what we want. All right. So we're going to taste. So let me go to the board a little bit for this part. All right. So the full formula is 2mg in the solid state plus O2 gaseous state giving you 2 moles of magnesium oxide solid state, right? So this is what we get for our balance equation. But we must remember what it is that we want and what we don't want. So we were given this and the question is asking for this. So we don't really care about oxygen. Don't care about that. So throw that away. We're going to focus on these two because we got this, but this is what we want. So let's move them to the center now. So two, sorry. So we have Mg, we have MgO, right? Magnesium, magnesium oxide. That's what we get, that's what we want. So how much magnesium did we get from our balanced equation? See it here? Two. So we have two. And how much magnesium oxide is there? Also two, see it here? And so the mole ratio is a two to two ratio. But what? We can cancel this down because two can go into two. So two into two goes one time. And so our mole ratio is a one to one ratio. And that is why you see on the slide, two to two goes down to one to one. Because magnesium and magnesium oxide, we had two of it. So two moles of this will produce two moles of that. So two two, but well, they can be cancelled down to one one. So it's a one to one ratio. That means any mole we get for magnesium must be the same for magnesium oxide. All right, and that is where number three comes in now. All right, so if we look at the slide, it says at number so step three now is 0.5 mole gives you x. So remember, it's a two to two ratio, which cancels down to a one to one. So anything you get for Magnesium is the same for magnesium oxide. That means if you, if you calculated 0.5 moles in number one, that means X is going to be 0.5 moles. All right, so that's step three. And then the last step, step four, is you're going to plug that now into your formula for magnesium oxide. So we just calculated the number of moles of magnesium oxide, right? And we can calculate the molar mass for magnesium oxide. And so when you say 0.5 times the molar mass, you're going to end up with 20 grams of magnesium oxide being formed. All right. We're going to do a few more. We'll come up from the break, but just, just, just a note, right, that these steps can not only be used for mass, but they can use them for molar or gas volumes and molar concentration. All right. The only thing is that you just substitute where possible. So instead of looking for mass, you look for volume. So looking for mass, you look for molar concentration. All right, it says to calculate the mass of lead, two hydroxide, that will be produced when a solution containing 3.4 grams of hydroxide ions react with a solution containing excess lead ions. Now, um, I realize that sometimes persons get these long questions, everybody starts stressing out, they start sweating, you know. But what they need to do is just take it step by step. All right, so the first thing, as we know, we need the chemical formula, all right, or the, we need the balance equation, rather. So it says to calculate the mass of lead to hydroxide that will be produced, all right? So the first thing you need to do, so we know that lead to hydroxide, right, and that's a solid, we know it's being produced. It goes at the back of the arrow. We know it's being produced. Then it says, when a solution containing 3.4 grams of hydroxide ions react with, so once you see that, that means it's a reactant, all right? So hydroxide will be a reactant. So it reacts with excess lead ions. So plus PB, 
2 plus, also in the aqueous state, right? And say we have our equation, and all we need to do now is balance it. There's two OH on this side, so we'll put two here, right? And one lead, one lead, and so it's now balanced, all right? And so what I've just done is just pick out from the question and formulated my balanced equation, all right? Now, as you can see here, the very fact that this is an ion, right? Because see it here, hydroxide with the OH minus and lead with the two plus. So because these are ions and they're forming a non-ion, then this is obviously an ionic equation, all right? So we can use the four steps to solve moles for ionic equation, all right? And so here we have lead plus hydroxide giving you lead hydroxide. Now what's step one again? Find the number of moles of the known. So let's go back. So the known here is hydroxide ions because we've got 3.4 grams of hydroxide ions. So that is our known, all right? But what does the question want? Yes, it wants the mass of lead hydroxide. So the only thing we're gonna focus on in the formula is the hydroxide ions and the lead hydroxide solid, all right? And so here, the molar mass of hydroxide is 16 plus one because it's just simply OH. So O is 16 and H is one. So 16 plus one is 17. So we get 17 grams per mole. So the final number of moles, we're gonna say the 3.4 that we get from the question, remember it's 3.4 grams, so we get the mass, I want to divide it by the molar mass, which is what, 17. And so now we end up with 0.2 moles of hydroxide ions, all right? So we finish step one. Step one, find the mole of the known. Next step, to find the mole ratio. So remember, we are not going to be focusing on the lead ion because the question now have nothing to do with it. So the only two we're going to focus on is the hydroxide ion and the lead hydroxide solid. And that's why for step two, all you're seeing is OH to PBOH2. Now from the equation, how much hydroxide is needed? Two moles. So we have our two right there. And how much moles of lead hydroxide is needed? Not needed, it's produced. One. So it's a two to one ratio. Two moles of hydroxide produce one mole of lead hydroxide. So that's step two. So step three now, we're going to find the number of moles of the unknown, what we want. All right, so since it's a two to one ratio, right? So if two moles give you one, 0.2 moles will give you X. Remember, we just calculated, see there, 0.2 moles of hydroxide. So we were not given two, we we're given 0.2. So if two moles of hydroxide give you one mole of lead hydroxide, then 0.2 moles of hydroxide will give you X. And all you will do, as we say, is cross multiply. So you will say X times two and 0.2 times the one. And that's why in the next step now, you say two X equal um, 0.2. Now, as we know from math class, how do we get X to be by itself? We will divide both sides by two, all right? So X is gonna to equal to 0.2 divided by two, and you end up with 0.1 mole of lead hydroxide. So now we have just found the number of moles for the unknown, right? Remember, the unknown is what you're trying to find, what you're trying to answer the question with. So the last step now, we're going to use our molar mass, we're gonna use the moles we just calculated to find mass. All right, so the molar mass is 207, which is from the lead, plus 16 times two, because you have two oxygen in hydroxide, right? So look, PbOH2, so there's one Pb, there's two O, and there's two H. So 207 plus 16 times two, plus one times two, all right? I left off the, the plus there, so it should be plus. So you will end up with 241 grams per mole. That is your molar mass. So simply now, drop it into your equation. 0.1 times 241, and the, and the mass you're gonna get of lead hydroxide produced is 24.1 grams of lead hydroxide. All right, we're gonna look at our next one. This time we're gonna use volume, because remember I said you can use 
different things. You don't have to use mass alone. You can use volume, you can use molar concentration. So here it says calculate the volume of sulfur trioxide gas formed at RTP when 9.6 grams of oxygen reacts with excess sulfur dioxide. All right. So we're given the REM for sulfur and for oxygen. So remember, what is step one? Step one, well, before step one, make sure you have your balance equation, right? Once you have your balance equation, then you start your steps. Step one would be to what? Find the number of moles of the known. And the known from this question here is 9.6 grams of oxygen. All right. So the volume occupied will be the formula that we're going to use, right? Because we were given volume and we're given the RTP. So mass of oxygen, we just finished the question, is 9.6 grams. And the molar mass of oxygen is going to be 16 times 2, which is 32. So the final number of moles to answer step one is 9.6 divided by 32. So now you're going to end up with 0 0.3 moles of oxygen. All right, so we just found the number of moles of the unknown. And so we're going to find the mole ratio. So let's go back. Our formula here is O2 plus SO2 plus 2SO2 giving you 2SO3. All right, and we're only going to focus on the oxygen and the sulfur trioxide because the question wants sulfur trioxide, but you were given oxygen. All right, so from the chemical formula, we see that there is one oxygen and two sulfur trioxide. So it's going to be a one to two ratio, all right? Because one, right, one oxygen produces two moles of sulfur trioxide. But the amount of moles of oxygen we just calculated, see there, was 0.3 moles. So one mole of oxygen gives you two moles of sulfur trioxide. That means 0.3 moles of oxygen is going to give you X. And since two is twice as much as one, we know that for the answer over here, so, right, it's going to be double 0.3. So 0.6 will be our answer because you're going to say 0.3 times two. All right. Then, once you're finished with that, you're going to plug it into your formula of volume occupied equal 0.6 times 24. We're using 24 because it's RTP. All right? So, we just calculated the 0.6, and we know that RTP is 24. And so, our answer is 14.4 dm cube. All right? And then, I'm going to do one more for today. And this time we're going to use molar concentration, right? So I'm trying to use the three different types that we can encounter in chemistry. So this one, again, don't be afraid of the long question. It's just to give information. So potassium carbonate reacts with nitric acid to produce potassium nitrate, carbon dioxide, and water. And now you're to calculate the mass of potassium nitrate formed when 40 cm cube of potassium carbonate solution with a concentration of 0.5 moles per dm cube reacts with excess nitric acid. So remember, we're all we're going to do, write our chemical equation first. So potassium carbonate reacts with nitric acid. So those are our reactants to produce potassium nitrate, carbon dioxide, and water. So those would be our products. Very good. All right. So here it is in red. So K2CO3 to HNO3. And we have the rest of our products. All right. So the first thing, we must find the number of moles for the known. From the question, the known is potassium carbonate. See there, 40 centimeter cube of it. So 40 centimeter cube. But remember, molar concentration must be in dm cube. All right. So we're going to convert this 40 cm cube to 0 0.04 dm cube. All right, and then we're going to multiply that by the concentration. Because remember, that was our fourth mole formula. Number of moles equal volume times molar concentration. All right, so 0 0.04 times the 0.5, you get 0 0.02. All right, now from the, from the equation, we know that the ratio between right, the carbonate and the nitrate is a 1 to 2 ratio. That means anything you get for carbonate, it must be half of what you get for nitrate, or nitrate will be double. 
So if this is 0.02, nitrogen is going to be 0.04. So once you calculate the molar mass, all you do now is drop it into your formula of mass equal number of moles times molar mass. And so you're going to get 4.04 grams of potassium nitrate. So it's very simple. All right. So that's all for today for our CC chemistry. And I really hope you grasp some of the points we discussed. Until next time, I am Roger Dawkins. <laughs>